to introduce my friend uh, uh, Larry <coughs> McGrath, who Larry uh, works at Johns Hopkins uh, University in the Humanities Center on European Intellectual History. And uh, he is writing currently a dissertation on science and spirit in France from 1873 to 1907. 1907, you may have guessed from what I heard say earlier, it is creative evolution by Bergson. 1873, I will let him have the pleasure of explaining what that date corresponds to. Thank you. Good evening. It was, um, it goes without saying, but actually uh, Shane said it quite well, but it was thanks to Henry Bergson's first visit to the United States in February of 1913 that the very institution bringing us together this evening, uh, the Maison Française, could be founded. In fact, at the news of Bergson visiting just beforehand in the press, there was an anonymous donor who gave $30,000 to the institution uh, so pleased as he was about uh, the arrival of Beric's son. And as Bashir nicely pointed out, in addition to his kind introduction, was that Columbia's president at the time, Nicholas Murray Butler, invited Beric's son, requesting first that he come as a guest in autumn of 2013, of two, uh, 1912. Pardon me. <laughs> Columbia had an arrangement with the Université de Paris which supported the visit of a French professor each autumn, and the Council of the University approved Bergson's delegation, but his teaching responsibilities, as he famously filled uh, packed lecture halls at the Collège de France, which was supposed to be teeming with students coming out of the windows, made it so he couldn't come until the year afterwards. Bergson would spend 25 days in America from February 2nd to the 27th of that year. And Butler ensured that Columbia treated Bergson to a red carpet welcome, in fact. He expedited the construction of his new president's mansion. So yes, uh, Nicholas Murray Butler did want Bergson to stay with him, but especially to um, show off his new pet. Um, and while here at Columbia, Bergson presented a public lecture series it deserves to be said again, all in French. It is striking to consider the celebrity that France's first superstar international philosopher achieved in America well before it was all well before it would be cemented with his 1927 Nobel Prize in Literature. Indeed, commentators have, que have frequently mentioned the Broadway traffic jam that was caused by the Bergson craze here in New York. And his celebrity was so appealing that tickets sold out here at Columbia to hear a French speaker who the majority of the audience could not even understand. He wasn't speaking at the Maison Française, which is before the general public. What deserves to be pointed out is that there some came at a time when European intellectuals claimed a cultural cachet among Americans. Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung famously came to Clark University in 1909, and Bertrand Russell would visit Harvard in 1914. But Bergson's visit was unique for the popular prestige that he garnered while here. It suggests comparison with what has come to be known as French theory in the academy, that milieu of post-structuralist thinkers, Foucault, Derrida, Deleuze, and company who, to borrow the subtitle of Francois Cousset's book by the same name, transformed the intellectual life of the United States from the 1970s to today. While the academic influence of these thinkers continues to pervade American departments of literature, history, anthropology, cultural studies, and, to a much lesser extent, philosophy, the memory of Bergson's visit recalls an initial and perhaps even more forceful wave of French theory in America. Prior to Bergson's visit, Columbia invited, as Shane well pointed out, the literary critic Gustave Vincent, and as well in the year before, in 1910, the French philosopher Emile Boutroux, who wrote um, in 1873 his thesis on the contingency of the laws of nature, a book that at least in my research, very much anticipates the 
uh, creative account of the contingency and creativity of nature that Bergson would identify in his third book, Creative Evolution. Columbia was at the cutting edge of what might be called then the first wave of French theory, well before the Johns Hopkins University hosted its 1966 conference, The Language of Criticism and the Science of Man, which marked the debut of America's fascination with post-structuralism. Indeed, at the time here, Columbia's Journal of Philosophy, Psychology, and Scientific Methods published myriad articles on Bergsonism, and Americans' towering pragmatist philosophers, William James and John Dewey, both corresponded privately with Bergson. Yet Bergson stands out not only for his academic influence, as I insist again, but more importantly, his popular prestige. Indeed, The Sun, then the chief rival of the New York Times, announced on February 2nd, Professor Henry Bergson will arrive today. A famous Jewish philosopher will spend three weeks in this country. Bergson's arrival received ample attention in the New York City press at a time when Jewish intellectuals received little. Quote, it is particularly fitting that Bergson should come to the United States, the son suggested, <coughs> for it is more directly associated with his philosophy than in any other part of the world. Popular enthusiasm manifested in the projection of hopes, desires, and fears onto his image, suggesting an urge on the part of many to at least adapt Bergson to American culture, and at most, claim him as their own. Writing as if his readership already knew that Bergson was in town, the Evening Post claimed, there is every reason why the principles of Henry Bergson's philosophy should prove even more popular in this country than they have abroad. While at Columbia, as Fisher pointed out, Bergson gave six public lectures, Spiritualité et Liberté, and even though Bergson requested a small lecture room, since, as he claimed, it is impossible for me to obtain the clarity of articulation if I'm obliged to make an effort with my voice, Columbia nonetheless outfitted him with a large hall that filled 500 attendants. Adorned in academic cap and gown, Bergson opened the series by directing it at what he characterized as the sudden expansion of physical science and how it informed what he saw as the dominant mathematical paradigm of philosophy. Bergson's engagement with the sciences drew on the focus of his corpus up until that point, which tackled advancements in the natural and human sciences of the late 19th century. His first two books took up the, took up the nascent scientific psychology. In Le Cé sur les données immédiates de la conscience, or what we call time and free will, he examined the limitations of psychophysics, that is, the psychological method of measuring the duration of perception. In 1896, with Matter and Memory, he drew on the burgeoning psychopathological research on aphasics in particular, and forcefully argued against the localization of memory in the brain. And finally, in Creative Evolution of 1907, it was the most significant book that Bergson published up to that point. And when he arrived in New York, it was just following the English translation in 1911. One newspaper published the headline, the coming of the new philosopher of creative evolution. In that book, Bergson critiqued the dominant models of Darwinian and Lamarckian evolutionary biology, as well as adaptationist theories of species divergence. In all of his major books, Bergson, Bergson pursued scientific advancements up to their limits, that is, up to the point where positive scientific observation gives way to metaphysical speculation. And although Ber Bergson would be understood in many Americans' minds, and in many minds still today, as a mystical or even a cult thinker, I want to stress that his work remained in close dialogue with the natural sciences. In his Columbia Lecture Series, Bergson challenged the scope of the sciences by focusing on their limited ability to explain away free will. Drawing again on his corpus, Bergson defended a pragmatist or what you might call anti-intellectualist account of consciousness, which understands thought as an act of volition rather than an act of abstraction or representation. As he succinctly argued in his first lecture, will can create thought, but thought cannot create will. 
By the second lecture, Bergson had to, quote, fight his way through another record audience after at least 2,000 persons either made written application or asked in person for cards for the lecture, one newspaper read. He spent the lecture situating the will, which he posited as the faculty of creation, as the proper object of philosophy. A journalist summarized Bergson's talk as follows. Science studies everything from the exterior, whereas philosophy studies everything from the interior. Now, it is difficult to discern whether Bergson was actually understood in everything that he just said, since his audience um, knew English and not necessarily French, and since the available documentation of the lectures are all translations from the French in which he spoke, that is, by an English student. Against the recommendation of Nicholas Murray Butler that he speak in English, Bergson preferred to deliver the lectures in his native tongue. Above all, he wrote, there would be the advantage that in French I could speak them, while in English I would be obliged to read them. Bergson prided himself on his ability to speak freely without notes. He even claimed that oration was critical to the very nature of philosophy's presentation. I attribute a good part of the effect of my lectures, he wrote, to their being spoken lectures. During the lectures that I gave recently in London, I had articulated distinctly enough to be able to be followed even by those who had only a very superficial familiarity with French. Yet, whether or not his lectures were understood, Bergson's erratic effect was certainly not lost on his audiences. His lectures in French were delivered without notes, John Burroughs wrote in the Atlantic Monthly, in an animated conversational style, his hands within a narrow circle being as active as his mind. The frail, thin, small-sized man with sunken cheeks, Burroughs continued, was somewhat nervous as he faced his American audience. But as he proceeded with his lecture on spirituality and liberty, he grew eloquent, aroused his audience, and made a profound impression. Bergson certainly, as Bashir noted, made an impression on the women in the audience. As one newspaper wrote, there were all sorts in the audience, distinguished professors and editors, well-dressed women and overdressed women. The Sun insinuated that women only attended Bergson's lectures to enrich their social standing. Continuing, Professor Henry Bergson drew enormous audiences in his lectures in America simply because it became the fashion of the hour when it was taken up by the 400. I did a little research, and that was the number of New Yorkers who allegedly actually mattered enough, and they could fit in one ballroom together. Interestingly, Bergson's public lectures were not even the most well-attended event here at Columbia. More than a thousand showed up on February 20th to witness him sip tea with the wives of Columbia faculty. <laughs> Occupying the public space at Bergson's lectures, dressing a la mode to boot, was a currency of cultural capital. The American woman in the audience could be more like une femme parisienne, who, as the New York Daily Eagle described, thinks it makes her pass for a blue stocking to be dressed in the latest fashion and to go hear a lecture at the Sorbonne of the Collège de France, and to hear such a philosopher as Henry Bergson, who lectures there. Women flock to hear him, and in that society, while closing their eyes in ecstasy, they talk of him as if he were a god. So one can only wonder just how ecstatic women supposedly felt while indulging in the rhythm of Bergson's French voice. But it is clear that the press packaged in gendered terms the prestige that sharing Bergson's air could confer. Bergsonism ultimately escaped Bergson's own control. The term was mobilized to link women in fashion in the public imagination, as a full-page article in the New York Tribune testified. And this was the favorite, uh, my favorite document that I came across in the archives. This article was encouraging women to buy from American rather than French designers at the outbreak of the First World War. Um, and I quote from it. The Bergson habit of mind likely to, address, likely to affect dressmakers. Henry Bergson makes a great deal of money and, when he is in America, has a corking time. <laughs> Divulging the information that a thing no sooner is than it is not. Our dressmakers will, if they have not already, soon get in the Bergsonian mood. 
On the other hand, their own for support for feminism in the suffrage movement here in the States has been well documented. He was interviewed regularly about his views on a host of social and political um, matters, from his opposition to anti-Semitism in Europe, to his admiration for racial diversity in America, and even his skepticism about Picasso's Cubism. Indeed, he was no fan of modern art at all. But one of the first interviews that Bergson conducted in New York City concerned the state of American education. The droll headline read, Bergson on our schools says French students work harder than ours. The interview followed his talk on the role of the university and democracy at the City College of New York, the fourth university that he attended while here. There, Bergson grew his largest audience, all male high schoolers and collegians, who greeted him with three chants of their college yell. In idiosyncratic fashion, Bergson attached the university's democratic ambition to the idea that, as he put it, life is and must be continuous progress. Bergson completed his time in New York with a private seminar series here for Columbia's philosophy department, titled The Method of Philosophy, Outline for Theory of Knowledge. The seminar stands out for having been the only event at which Bergson spoke English, and one would assume that John Dewey was in attendance, as well as the department chair, Frederick Woodbridge and Walter Pitkin. Pitkin is notable, it's worth adding, for having launched a debate over Bergson's thought in the department's journal, beginning with his article, James or Bergson, or Who is Against the Intellect? Pitkin argued that William James got Bergson thought wrong in his lectures published in what will become a pluralistic universe, and that Bergson's was the superior pragmatism. Pitkin urged, quote, a perpetual injunction against every attempt to identify or even to harness up the radical empiricism of Cambridge with Parisian intuitionalism. Throughout his visit, Bergson was compared to William James, who died just two years before. There is every reason why the principles of Henry Bergson's philosophy, the Evening Post wrote, should prove even more popular in this country than they have been abroad. And the reason was that pragmatism, which in essence is very much the same thing as Bergsonism, the article claimed, has been imposed on philosophical speculation in this country by the high authority of William James. From another angle, the Sun reported, Professor Bergson had found a disciple in the late William James. Whether James influenced Bergson or, as another author claimed, Bergson had found the key for which James himself had been searching vainly, it was clear that a bond between the two had been forged in popular and academic culture. In light of the close relationship between Bergson and James, it is easy to think that Americans' first encounter with Bergson was also his own missed encounter with James. James and Bergson had met before in person, in fact, three times, but never on James' home soil. And given that Bergson had invited James in 1910 to Paris after having nominated him as an associate member of l'Académie des Sciences Morales et Politiques, Bergson's visit had all the trappings of a reciprocal invitation. He opened his first public talk here at Columbia by acknowledging if America had produced only William James, she would have made a sufficiently great contribution to the world in the domain of philosophy and psychology. It was fitting that Bergson then delivered his final lecture here in America at Harvard, the former university of William James. His absence did not go unnoticed. In fact, James' son was in the audience and he praise on Bergson. The title was La Philosophie de Changement, or the Philosophy of Change, and Bergson opened it by paying tribute to James. Bergson, of course, uh, spoke in one of those, what is it, savage places? Um, Princeton, on February 12th, giving a talk titled Philosophy and Common Sense. But when asked for the transcripts of the lecture, Bergson had none to offer. Indeed, like many of his lectures, he spoke extemporaneously. The 25 days that Bergson spent in America were packed. As Nicholas Murray Butler warned Bergson before he came, so soon as your coming is notified, you too will be overwhelmed with invitations to deliver addresses. Although Bergson accepted offers from Princeton, Harvard, Columbia, and City College, he declined even more offers, including, as I found in his dossier, the University of Pennsylvania, 
Yale, University of Chicago, and Ohio State. But the more striking documents that I found in Bergson's dossier were the myriad invitations from churches, Unitarian, Anglican, and Catholic, pleading Bergson to speak before their congregations. He didn't. Bergson certainly found himself in awe of his wide appeal in America. <coughs> If he, in fact, inaugurated the first wave of French theory, as I'd like to suggest in America, then the Derridians of yesteryear would surely, surely envy the cultural tsunami that was Bergsonism. In an interview conducted the morning of his February 27th departure in 1913, Bergson revealed, I know of no other country where you could find such large and responsive audiences to listen to lectures on philosophy in French. If only America was still like that. Um, Bergson would return to America twice amidst the tunnel of the First World War. But his missions were diplomatic and not philosophical. Nonetheless, Bergson left an impressive philosophical stamp on America. It even touched the bout of seasickness that Bergson endured on his way home from America aboard the steamship, the France. One reporter questioned whether Bergson would have attributed his upset stomach to purely physical causes, as if it was just what he ate and just what his stomach, how his stomach reaction, thereby renouncing the power of philosophical speculation. Thank you. Professor of Philosophy at the University of Lille Bois. In fact, to introduce Frédéric in a couple of words is just to say that Bergson is back and very much alive. Bergson is in France, and he had a huge role to play in that return of Bergson or in that review of Bergson to play on his uh, latest book title, uh, Review. And Frederick has done that since his PhD in 1995, they devoted to Bergson. And he believes also in collective work. He has really created a movement around uh, uh, Bergsonism, being the director of Anna Bergsonian. The direct, he directed a critical edition of Bergson's Earl. And he just directed a lexicon of philosophy titled Song. Sans mot de la philosophie, and he invited uh, nine friends, philosophers, to be part of that, and I was happy to be one of those. So, indeed, the widest and the most cruel gap in time that passed since Bergson's visits in Colombia a, a century ago might not be that centennial, how, however wide and uh, large a century is, the centennial that we very happily and profoundly try to celebrate today. To the contrary, this centennial, to me indeed, should be the way to finally go beyond the damages of another gap in time, another space in time, I would say, in a phrase that I heard was not very um, correct in English. And this pass the tongue or lapse the tongue. There is another gap of time that is more cruel and, and wider than the century itself. And this cruel gap of time is not the one you would think. It's not the centennial, and it's not, and it's not uh, also another gap that was very vivid and important, and that occurred immediately after Bergson's visit in 1913, and uh, Larry alluded to it too, that is the gap in time that was linked to the outbreak of the First World War, which would see Bergson's come back to the US, this time with an official and special mission to the then president, Woodrow Wilson himself. So there are two very important gaps, the centennial between 1913 and now, and the First World War. But the most cruel and the most important gap that I want to deal with today very briefly is none of these two gaps. It's another one that maybe would give its meaning, its full meaning, to the other two I mentioned. 
And this gap I want to deal with, to me it's the most significant, but it can be surprising in a way, because it is a gap between two periods in Bergson's philosophy itself. A gap between two uh, interventions, two texts, two, two series of uh, philosophical thoughts, the one he delivered here, and the way it appeared in his own work um, a few uh, years, actually around between 15 and 20 years later. It can be surprising. How can a time distance um, between some philosophical texts by the same author be more significant and actually give their meaning to the more obvious and critical times of the century, the 20th century, and of the war, the first one, and maybe even the second world war, in a sense. This is, however, what I want to show, to be found today, to try and show to you tonight. What is very striking, indeed to me, when I read the summaries, the summaries of both private and public lectures that you, heard, that you just heard Bergson did deliver here, when you read the summaries of both private and public lectures that Bergson gave me here in Colombia in 1913, is the following fact. It is that both subjects, both questions that Bergson dealt with philosophically and orally in 1913 would be written down in his philosophical books, but very much later, namely and only in his two latest books, that is, his moral and political book that he published very late in his work in 1932, whose title you might remember, The Two Sources of Morality and Religion, which was published very late in his, in his work. He was, uh, he was more than 73 years old, so Bergson was one of the youngest and one of the oldest uh, writing philosophers in the history of philosophy. With his first major book at less than 30, and his last major book at more than, than 70. Um, so that, that is a big gap between what he said here and 1932, but there is another gap between what he said here and what he said in his last publication, which was the publication of his second collection of essays, called in French La Pensée et le Mouvement, and very tellingly translated in 1946, we don't know if uh, Bergson uh, approved of the title in English, but very tellingly translated into English as The Creative Mind. So there is Mind Energy in 1919 and The Creative Mind in uh, 1946, the two collections of essays by Bergson with very close title, Mind Energy and Creative Mind, but I won't go into that uh, right now. And um, it is what I want to show is that what Bergson taught in both his classes here, his seminars, here in 1913, would come up to the front with the public Public, published only in 1932 and 1934, with a gap of uh, 19 and 21 years, so 20 years, so to speak. But the gap is not only a theoretical distance, it is a historical and also political distance, and in fact it has something of a tragedy to it. What Bergson said here, which was quite important, became inaudible in the 30s. What was central in the, in the year in the beginning of the century, the 1910s, was, was passed, was, was inaudible 20 years later. So the gap between the oral and the written versions is actually tells something about the 20th century in philosophy and also in politics. That's what I want to, to show. And there is a third gap that I want to mention, and I will go very briefly into the three points. The third gap is with, between Bergson's political mission in 1917 and 18, and the account he gave of that in 1936, in a, in a very uh, seldom piece of uh, autobiography that he wrote, and which, whose title is very telling too, it's called in French, Mes Missions, My Missions, giving to his political embassy uh, uh, to Woodrow Wilson, both uh, uh, diplomatic meaning, mission, it's administrative language, and a mystical meaning. Mission is also, of course, nationalism. And, uh, so he gave this word mission, mission both the technical and the mystical uh, meaning. So you have three gaps. And I want to go very briefly to the uh, three of them. Um, the first one, 
would deal with what Erickson taught in his private class here, the private, the reserved class. He, he wanted to reserve a technical class in philosophy for, as we heard, uh, advanced students and colleagues only. Private seminar, as they say in the Collège de France. We have in the Collège de France the private seminar and the public class. So actually he would reproduce here in Colombia the structure of the teaching in the French Collège de France. And what he wanted to teach, but of course he didn't succeed because he didn't succeed to restrict the audience and it would be the private seminar would be very public. But, you know, it's there are some ambivalence towards publicity and popularity that you encounter with the pretext of the voice. Of course, it's not only the voice, it's the uh, relationship to popularity. Um, what, he, what he wanted to teach in his private class is method dealing with theory of knowledge. And actually, the title is very surprising. The title that we found in the summary it is called uh, A Sketch for a Theory of Knowledge which is very modest for a philosopher being at the height of European philosophy at the time. Uh, a sketch for a theory of knowledge. But this title is very telling. It shows us that what Bergson wants to present to his American audience is both difficult, because it is reserved, and new, because it is a sketch for a theory of knowledge, which could, of course, be a somewhat shocking because he published three books, it, it ignited the quarrel over Europe and America, and now he wants to, to tell us that he didn't have any theory of knowledge, and it's, not, it's only in 1913 that he's going to present it. Actually, what is new is very important. In 1930, here in America, Bergson is presenting a new theory of knowledge, or is more precisely um, making clear the new theory of knowledge that they reached in 1907 in the creative evolution. And it is a theory different from the preceding one, different from the one that William James had liked so much, different from the one that has ignited what is now called the quarrel, the war of Bergsonism. Bergson here, to put it in a word, what Bergson defended here in Colombia, contrary to what he defended and was best known for, is that there is no general theory of knowledge. There is no general knowledge to be criticized. There is no general intelligence, intellectual knowledge that philosophy would have to criticize. To put it in a word, there is no general concept of concepts. There is no generality of knowledge that you have to destroy. What he defines here, and then I quote, I'm quoting the summary we have. We don't have the text of the class. We have just the summary. But the summary is very telling. What Bergson writes here, or what is reported here, I quote, is that what Professor Henri Bergson taught to his American audience is, quote, some concepts are natural, many are artificial. And the most important sentence is the following. There is no theory, explanation, or critique that holds for all concepts at the same time. So you have some concepts that are made by the human mind, that do not have any correspondence into reality. You have some concepts that are real, and for, it is, for example, mathematical concepts applying to the spatial matter of the universe. So that physics is true, because you can apply physical concepts to physical reality. But the most important point is that for every single concept in human knowledge, you have to make a different critique. Some of them are grounded, some of them are not. And you have to make a special theory for every single concept, which is totally new because Bergson was famous for what we just heard, that is criticizing all concepts for the sake of intuition. So what you know now is that, of course, you, you want to reach the knowledge with, without concepts, and in the summary you can still find this pretension. But what you have to do is make an individual study of every concept in our knowledge. This is a major breakthrough in Bergson's philosophy, and a breakthrough that would appear only with no reference to the Columbia Lectures in 1934, in the beginning of the second part of the introduction to the creative mind. And no one noticed the change in Bergson's philosophy, except for one great commentator, whose name was Georges Canguilhem, 
major French philosopher of the center of the century. Georges Canguilhem, who noticed that Bergson changed his philosophy of knowledge in 1934, not knowing that it was here in 1913 that it occurred first. So you have to remi remember that Bergson is not the dualist that we know. It's not only intuition, which is true, and concepts that are fictitious. Among concepts, you have true and false concepts, and you have to make a single theory for a, every concept. Bergson is not the irrationalist, the general critique of rationality that he was branded at the time, that the Sun and the New York Times were you know, so fascinated with. So it's more complicated, but no one noticed. It appeared only 15 years, 20 years later. The second gap is much more important and tragic, even. It has to do with ethical and political uh, subjects. And the gap that occurred between the oral presentation here and the written statement 20 years later proved a disaster in Bergson's reception. It proved a disaster because what what he presented here was the beginning of his writing on eth ethics that he started to write about after 1907 and with, it would take 25 years to, to get to the final statement of his ethics. In the, in the meantime, after 1907, all cultural Europe had built Bergson ethics in, um, for him. I mean, building like uh, futurism in Italy, uh, vitalism, the morals of Elan Vital, the polit politics of Elan Vital. Everybody thought that he had a Bergsonian ethics. Everybody but Bergson, who didn't give it ethics, it would take him 25 years. What he said here is that you have not only an ethics of Elan Vital, that he would uh, find the criterion of in what he calls joy as opposed to pleasure, but you have to um, pay attention to what he calls in his Columbia lessons, this, this, the public ones. It's not the private one that were on knowledge, but the public one that were on ethics, joy, and, and practical uh, uh, consequences of philosophy. So Bergson is very clear. For co colleagues, you speak of theory. For the greater public, you speak of practice. And what he wants to draw the attention to is that in mankind, you have two tendencies. One tendency that uh, brings, that, that is a tendency to put it shortly towards unity. And unity that is also universal peace. A tendency towards association, that has very soon put it. And 25, 20 years later, he would call that a tendency towards open society. He coined the phrase open society, open morality, open religion, universal, ethics. The other tendency is a tendency to, towards disassociation, as we see in the summary. Disassociation, which is an incredible word, uh, by the way. And Bergson very elliptically, in 1913, here in Colombia, says that the first tendency, the tendency towards association, we need, I quote, a long effort of will and genius. It means some obstacles. Disassociation is the nature of humanity. War is the nature of humanity, as opposed to peace, which is the goal. And it is only in 1932 that he will explicitly state the opposition between the open and the closed, open morality and closed morality, open society and closed society, and criticize war. Why is the gap so tragic? The gap is tragic because during the war, Bergson took part in the closed society. Bergson made war speeches, very nationalist, mobilizing Elan Vital as French and the force of matter as German. And of course, he was on the side of the close. So the, the, this gap is very, is very uh, sort of um, not only theoretical but political in its own term and has something tragic to it. But as, that's where occurs the, the third gap occurs. The gap between the mission here, the political mission that the French government gave, gave him, and the account he gives in Mes Missions in 1936. What Bergson did here in America, going towards Wilson as an ambassador <coughs> sent by the French government, he was really, he wanted to reconcile what was contradictory. 
what was contradictory? It was that he was philosophically for the universal, for peace, but politically he had to be, he chose to be, for France against Germany, to take part into this terrible intellectual war that the First World War was. I mean, you had French science against German science. Europe was divided not only politically, but intellectually, and Bergson was part of that, just as Max Scheller in Germany. And when he comes here, he finds in Wilson a hope, the hope that the political and the philosophical will really unite, and that's why he's so fascinated with Wilson's project for the Society of Nations. And after the war, as you know, Bergson did engage himself in Wilson's project, and he was the direct, first director of what, of what is now the UNESCO in Paris, the equivalent of the UNESCO in the SDN, Society of Nations, uh, which is now the UNESCO for the um, uh, United Nations Organization. For the... Of course, Bergson's hope broke. The Society of Nations was not approved by the US Senate. Then Europe broke into fascism and uh, totalitarianism. Mm -hmm. And in 1936, Bergson recognizes that the failure of Society of Nations gave way to the worst uh, future to Europe. He uses the Latin phrase, corruptio optimi pessima. The destruction of the best gives the worst. And he recognizes that there, is, there was an obstacle. And that's his own idealism in Wilson and Society of Nations was maybe an illusion. So we have three gaps. Three gaps. Uh, Bergson's new theory of knowledge that was published 20 years later. Bergson's close and open society that was published 20 years later. And Bergson's idealism with democracy, society of nations, that was destroyed in the 30s, of course. So it's a, a gap in uh, not only theory, but practice. The question I want to ask to conclude is, are these gaps only failures? They, they have something of a failure, and they account for Bergson's, after the glory of Bergson, as one commentator put it in France recently, the decay of Bergson was very brutal because, of course, of these gaps. You have a vitalist Bergson, a nationalist Bergson, a skeptical Bergson, in a, in a, a, apparently. And it was not good for the new generation after the First World War, but they didn't know that Bergson was not a rationalist, but uh, had a theory of concept, that he was not a nationalist in philosophy, but has a philosophy of universal uh, ethics and politics, and so forth. So the real Bergson was hidden under the political Bergson, the public Bergson. And so what I want to, to, uh, to say to conclude is that this, uh, there is a failure, there is a, a tragedy here, because of course the, the real Bergson was sort of hidden under the public uh, activity. But the dualities in Bergson, between concepts and, and intuitions, the closed and the open, society of nations and its obstacles, are no failure. They are really the best of his philosophy. What we have to know today is Bergson's internal tensions, that of course he advocates intuitions, but he also has a theory of concepts. That of course he advocates the open, but he knows that the closed is here. So our task today, I would say, is to take the full Bergson visit into account. That is, the full tensions in, in Bergson's philosophy, what he really said to his American public, that he has a theory of concept and a theory of morality, but it took him 15 years to publicly um, state what he privately said orally here. And to conclude, I would say that this gap in time, this space in time, shows us that Space and time, which is the, basically the major person in position, space and duration, as you know. Space and time are not only a duality in the object of philosophy, in the object of Bergson's philosophy, uh, the law. It is also a duality in the practice of philosophy. Philosophy is a practice that in time is not, but it has also some space, it takes part into history. And this duality between space and time can bring to philosophy not only theoretical, but practical and sometimes tragical misunderstandings. But it can also bring to philosophy not only 
theoretical intuitions, but a practical power of orientation that I think is still of actuality today. That's where I want to be. Now my pleasure to introduce our last panelist, who is Matthias Hirel. Uh, Matthias is a professor of philosophy at Ecole Normale Supérieure. He is a specialist of pragmatism in general, William James in, in, in particular. He, um, he wrote extensively on, uh, in that field since his PhD at the Sorbonne uh, on Years and Pragmatism. And he recently actually organized in 2011, I believe, a conference on, on Dewey. So he was uh, very much indicated to talk about the encounter between brackets between Dewey and uh, Bergson during uh, Bergson's visit. He's a member of the editorial board of Transactions of the Charles Sanders Peirce Society, also a member of the scientific committee for the European Journal of Pragmatism. And we were very lucky that uh, Matthias was also like Bergson on a mission here in New York for this particular week when this panel was taking place. So we just grabbed him and he was generous enough to accept my invitation. So thank you. So, um, I would like to, to share uh, a perplexity tonight. Uh, it's the fact that we have many studies about uh, Bergson and William James. Uh, we even have books now. We have studies about their respective accounts of truth and reality, of evolution, of the stream of consciousness, but oddly enough, we have nearly no studies uh, about uh, Dewey and Bergson and about their relationship. Uh, there is no Bergson entry in Westbrook's uh, outstanding Dewey biography, and it also applies to a great deal of major monographies uh, about uh, Dewey. Uh, still, there is evidence that Dewey uh, had read closely some of uh, Bergson's works uh, just before uh, Bergson came here in 1913. And he even asked in a 1912 review, uh, who doesn't read Bergson today? So that's a kind of uh, acknowledgement. And there was also evidence that he had criticisms of a uh, major Bergsonian concept. And so the question I would like to ask is what exactly uh, is the philosophical uh, counterpart of their physical meeting uh, here one century ago in 1913. Because they met, but what, what, uh, what can we find in Dewey's work that is that would be uh, something like an acknowledgement of this, uh, this meeting? He, as I said, he had read Bergson. He credits both uh, James and Bergson to have placed change at the core of reality. Uh, still, on the background of uh, this, uh, this, this reading and of this appraisal, uh, he has some important philosophical reservations or scruples that must be mentioned insofar as they involve essential Dewean uh, tenets. Uh, I will give two samples tonight about knowledge and action and, if time permits, about intuition that might explain why Bergson is important to Dewey, uh, but also maybe uh, why he's not that much present in, in Dewey's works in, in general. Uh, so, first thing, uh, that would be a, a, a short uh, factual session just to, to give a sample of uh, a Jewish text about Bergson because the, the silence in the, the literature is very intriguing because the, the, there are writings uh, by Jewish about uh, Bergson. We have uh, a review uh, uh, in 1912, just before Bergson came, uh, a very dense review of matter and memory, uh, perception and organic action. Uh, the same year, uh, Dewey wrote a short introduction to bibliography of and about Bergson uh, for a volume that has to be presented to Bergson during uh, his stay here. Uh, it's short, but uh, it's there. And during the war, he also wrote an unpublished piece that was finally found in uh, 1965 and published by Gérard de Ledal. It's a very nasty piece. It's uh, Spencer and Bergson, and he, he, he claims that there is a kind of permanent Spencerian deposit in Bergson's uh, works. It was not published uh, during uh, Dewey's lifetime, but it's an important place. I think he, he also devoted a couple of lectures uh, when he came to China in 1920. Uh, uh, a couple of lectures to, to Bergson was in the, the distinguished company of uh, William James and uh, Bertrand Russell. Uh, it's difficult to, to use these uh, lectures uh, because, uh, as you may know, uh, they are significant uh, of, uh, as regards uh, Bergson's prestige. Uh, but they must be approached with uh, caution, since, as we know, we don't have the original manuscript. They were, uh, they were translated from the uh, Chinese transcript, so uh, 
it, as regards the, the, the philology of this text, it's, it's uh, very difficult uh, to use them. And uh, the, the editors of uh, Dewey's collected works uh, told that, uh, I quote, the possibility of error in this final text is by an calculation, which is a kind of uh, uh, remarkable sobriety. Uh, much later, Dewey reviewed the true sources in 1935. Uh, and just with this text, we already have an important corpus. And one should also add uh, the many scattered references in some of the uh, Jewish major texts. I'm thinking uh, in, partic of, in particular um, of uh, human nature and conduct, of experience and nature, of uh, art as experience. And there are quite a number of important developments in the monumental Jewish correspondence. There are letters to Canon. To Bentley, to his students about uh, town psychism, about, about intuition, about knowledge. Uh, and he tells a lot about Bergson, uh, about uh, Bergson and James, uh, for example. And so, just if we look at the text, that there should be some substance for a close study of uh, uh, Dewey's stance towards uh, Bergson. And so, that's still something to, to do, and uh, it's still uh, in order as far as, the, as far as the literature is concerned. But just maybe to, to start this uh, exploration or this trade blazing, uh, I will not be uh, able to, to give a complete uh, overview tonight, uh, we might get a, a sample of uh, Dewey's uh, reading um, in 1912, just before uh, Bergson came, by uh, paying a, a short look uh, at the, the, the review of Matter and Memory. Uh, it's interesting that uh, Dewey chose this text uh, because, uh, as you know, creative evolution uh, certainly struck many readers in the States, in the, in the states uh, prompting James to call in correspondence person a magician. Uh, and matter uh, and memory was the text uh, that Dewey chose. Uh, just it was uh, then just translated, and the topic of um, Dewey's review is actually perception, but uh, his main one. Uh, here lies with uh, the account of reality and the account of uh, action also. Uh, Jewish thesis, uh, first, as a familiar sound, it is that Bergson, uh, contrasting uh, reality as distorted and refracted from the standpoint of bodily needs on the one hand, and reality as grasped by a purely theoretical vision on the other hand, would have reintroduced dualism at the very core of philosophy. So it's a basic reading of Bergson at the time, but it's important to keep in mind that Dewey, uh, in some way, uh, entertained it. I, I quote just a, a few lines from the, the review. Uh, Dewey says, A philosophy which holds that the facts of perception and science are to be explained from the standpoint of their connection with organically useful action, while it also holds that philosophy rests upon a radically different basis is perforce a philosophy of reality that is already afflicted with a dualism so deep as seemingly to be in eradication. <coughs> so that's the Dewey's stance at the time, just before uh, Bergson came here. And diagnosing this tension might not be original with Dewey. Uh, everyone, Dewey even claims, is aware that there is a tension, a twofold strain uh, in Bergson's philosophy. The first strain where, quote, Perception, common sense knowledge, and science are explained on the ground of their intimate connection with action. <coughs> and the second strain, where most of our enduring philosophical fallacies are attributed to carrying over, I quote, over into metaphysics the results and methods of the knowledge that has been formed with the ex exigencies of action in view, unquote. And so, in, in this view, the philosophical uh, problems and the philosophical uh, fallacies would be the long shadows cast by our actions in a domain where they don't belong. There would be their indirect uh, effect. And so this twofold uh, strain that uh, Dewey diagnoses in person is ultimately grounded on a strong opposition between knowledge and uh, action. And as we can expect, uh, Dewey uh, would be glad to acknowledge uh, just the first strain, the connection between perception, uh, common sense, and action, and to work uh, at this level. The scruples he has uh, are with the second one, the, 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 the strain concerning uh, philosophy and its, uh, its proper object. Of course, uh, according to Dewey, there are recurring philosophic problems and metaphysical fallacies, but they don't especially come from a deformation that would be exerted by the exigencies of action uh, in general. On the contrary, these fallacies come from the fact that we generally tend to overlook 
uh, that even our metaphysics is connected with our science and our common sense and ultimately with action. Uh, and we miss that point precisely because we generally overlook the connection between science, perception and action in the first place. Uh, the quest for certainty, for example, in 1929 will be entirely devoted to making uh, that point. But it's already clearly articulated uh, in the in the Bergson review. So according to Dewey, we are in, in dire need of a revision of the Office of Philosophy, a reconstruction of it, but there is no such thing as two kinds of knowledge, uh, or for that matter, as two realms of the real. Uh, giving up the, the spectator theory of knowledge, uh, that is in some way presupposed by the opposition between knowledge and action, uh, would help, according to Dewey, not only uh, in dealing with the major problems of epistemology, but also with the metaphysical questions raised uh, by science. So, when you, you pay close attention to that review, uh, Dewey objects both to the idea that there will be two such realms of reality, one distorted by the senses or by action, and another one, uh, two, so two such realms of reality, as in itself and as distorted by the senses, and also he objects to the idea that our senses would shrink uh, reality, so much so that there would be an excess of reality uh, over the senses, on the senses, a pure presence that would be larger than what we interact with. Uh, there is more to reality than uh, what we can, uh, that what can interact with us, that would be Bergson's argument, according to, to Dewey uh, at that time. And this larger thing uh, would be, for Dewey, a kind of uh, unknowable that philosophy would do better to dispense with. Uh, on the contrary, uh, according to, to Dewey, reading uh, Bergson, action, interests, usefulness are integral parts of reality, and as such, they penetrate into it. Uh, they are part of reality. And a possibility that Dewey wants to explore is that when Bergson claims that in so doing uh, our senses shrink or distort reality, this only attests to the fact that not that Bergson has a broader notion of reality, uh, but that he has too narrow a concept of action. Uh, of course there are routines, there are blind actions of course, but there are also actions with a broader scope and uh, Dewey wants to take them into account and to enlarge them. The, the picture. The main living problem for Dewey when he reads Bergson, and that's still true uh, for the several decades that were to come, the main living problem for Dewey is that of creative, collective, and intelligent action. He has a name for it, it's the, the public, uh, as opposed to uh, two self centered uh, virtualities of action. So if the problem is not with action in general, it's with the scope uh, of uh, action. And so the crucial division does not fall between knowledge and action. It doesn't fall between two kinds of reality. Uh, it falls between two scopes of action, more or less inclusive. Uh, here is uh, Dewey's main reply to Bergson in the review. Uh, quote, genuine theoretic knowledge penetrates reality more deeply, not because it is opposed to practice, but because a practice that is generally free, free social and intelligent touches things at a deeper level than practice that is capricious, egoistically centered, sectarian, and bound down to routine." Unquote. So that's Dewey's message to Bergson, and actually we have Bergson's uh, reply and response to the review. And it's very interesting uh, that uh, the main uh, clarification in Bergson's letter, so written in at the beginning of January 1913. Uh, in, so the main clarification involves uh, action. And there are two things uh, in that reply. Bergson uh, claims that he endorses a partial uh, realism concerning geometry, and thus he acknowledges several realms uh, of, uh, of reality. And second, he remarks that he would not be ready to endorse a broader account of action uh, than the one he had relied upon uh, in matter in, in memory. We have uh, Bergson's answer, I'm just putting a few lines. Uh, concerning the topic of matter, I believe that the geometry which is contained and manifested in it is something real in itself, as we examine it at a much deeper level. That is why, here or elsewhere, it would be impossible for me to define all the reality in terms of action, unless one would expand a great deal the meaning of the world. I think this is the essential point which divides us. And so the validity of this expansion certainly is the main bone of contention here, 
Uh, and it, it looks like two philosophers agreed on their disagreement, which is quite uh, rare in, uh, in philosophy. <laughs> uh, I, I will add something on style, and maybe I will leave the things on uh, intuition for the discussion so that we, we have time, uh, time for, for questions. But just with that uh, in mind, so the, the clarification of knowledge and action, the different stance toward uh, action, uh, it might be said, and it is a telling argument, that Dewey's review quotes uh, mainly from the first uh, chapter of matter and memory. That he has not taken into account a, a person's special way of uh, arguing, uh, argumenting. Uh, and such a reading is sketched, for example, in the short introduction uh, to this letter that uh, Mularki uh, provides in the new version. And there is nothing surprising uh, in that attention to the first chapter of Matter and Memory. Uh, many readers have been struck uh, by the philosophy of images displayed in that, in that very chapter. And uh, a reader of James's radical empiricism is bound to be very responsive to this aspect of uh, Versailles school. Still, uh, as we know, and uh, Frederick Worms has devoted the whole book to cast light on the structure and the dynamics of matter and memory, as well uh, as a full chapter on the Bergson and the Deux Sens de la Vie, to the, the structure of matter and memory. The first chapter needs to be integrated in the whole structure of the book, and in particular, connected with the last, uh, the last chapter. Be as it may, it's not the case that Julie has been blind to this particular and transitory status of the first chapter of the book. And he has a remark on Bergson's style that I think uh, interesting. Uh, he's quite aware that dualisms are not the last words in Bergson's thoughts, but he does not subscribe to the particular way they are overcome in Bergson, uh, or for that matter, uh, brought back to their point uh, of emergence. And so he, he, he has a letter to a current uh, Chisholm Frost in 1937, so quite later than the review, but it's interesting because it's about Bergson's style, and I think it conveys a kind of exasperation, uh, a gentle exasperation uh, towards the style, and I, I wish to, to share that. So he wrote to me about Bergson. These dualisms between intellect and intuition, the physical and the vital, are suggestive if taken to indicate the limits of a problem. But first, he takes them as final, and then he whittles down the differences till they tend to merge. And the particular way in which they are supposed to merge is often as irritating as his original dualisms. It is very hard to pin down, which accounts, I suppose, for why he is so much more suggestive than most writers and let it leave one in something of a maze. So that's in private correspondence, it's not. Uh, a published review, but Bergson's method with uh, dualisms, uh, Dewey argues uh, in this, the, the, the next lines of the letter, leaves one oscillating. And Dewey adds, it's another quote, I think it's important, and then he tends, so Bergson, tends to set forth the oscillation as the fundamental truth, unquote. So the true philosophers would have a, a different take on dualisms. For Dewey, they generally refer to a fragmentation of action itself. If you face dualisms, that means that the action in which you take place is already fragmented for social or other practical reasons. Uh, and it prompts for uh, a reconstruction of the situation. For Bergson, uh, they would have to be followed, uh, these terms of the dualism, until the point where both segments of the dualism merge uh, into each other. And the oscillation Dewey detects uh, it would only in his eyes uh, be the first word and certainly not the last one. So there might, there might be a difference uh, about the philosophic style, uh, about the general uh, stance uh, toward uh, action. Uh, there are also important and telling differences, but I, I will not embark into them on intuition, on elan vital, uh, uh, the risk quite wary of uh, elan vital and human nature and conduct. But I would just like to. Uh, to give uh, a few words uh, in, in, in conclu of conclusion so that we have time maybe for the, the discussion here after. Uh, the two men have met in 1913, so just after the, the review have been uh, <coughs> and they certainly agreed uh, on more uh, points than the ones, or the few ones, uh, I had a chance to stress tonight. They obviously had many adversaries in common, and Bergson's views on art uh, certainly surfaced in art as experience from time to time. Bergson's view of duration certainly also plays 
an important role in text that just mention Bergson's name in passing. So we would have to take into account not only the explicit commentaries upon, upon Bergson, but other texts that might have a, a Bergsonian twist, but even the, if they don't actually quote uh, Bergson in detail. And I'm thinking uh, of the very late uh, text on time and individuality, uh, in one of the very uh, last volumes of Dewey's collected works. Still, uh, both men certainly may come from different directions and having different agendas in mind. Even though Dewey is responsive to Bergson's accounts of the philosophical obsession with fixity, he thinks that Bergson that did not wish or did not manage to break up with the traditional idea of knowledge as a complete possession and contemplation of its object. That's something we might qualify uh, uh, for this talk. Uh, and this was at odds uh, with the whole idea of the reconstruct task, reconstructive task sorry, uh, of philosophy. Assessing in which way it is true, so in which way uh, Jewish criticisms are deserved, uh, would be a, a way to reopen their dialogue, a dialogue that started exactly here, one century ago. Thank you.